It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thank you so much. Speaker, the, um, the, my first question this morning is to the Premier. Tomorrow, the Legislature will uh, debate an NDP bill, the Time to Care Act, for the fourth time in our legislature. It's a bill that would set in line or in law rather a requirement that each and every person that lives in long-term care is uh, ensured to have 4 hours of hands-on care each and every day. But we shouldn't be having to debate this bill yet again, Speaker. It should already be the law in Ontario that seniors get this kind of attention. It was one of several urgent recommendations, in fact, made by the government's own staffing study that was tabled three months ago for the minister. So the question is, we're in the midst of this pandemic, and it's killed nearly 2,000 residents of long-term care, so why is the Ford government continuing to study a study that has solutions that we've brought to this House in four separate occasions in terms of long-term care reform? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I can assure everyone in Ontario that our government has been actively working uh, throughout COVID and before COVID to ensure that the staffing in long-term care was where it needs to be going forward. After many, many years of neglect by the previous government and from the uh, opposition members across the way, we have been actively looking to, to shore up staffing using measures through the Ministry of Health as the lead on staffing, understanding the report that was provided by our expert panel. Many of those measures are underway. Uh, we are actively supporting our homes, in uh, long-term care homes, to make sure they're getting the staffing they need on an urgent basis, as well as developing the staffing that will be needed as we build more capacity and rebuild Response. and repair long-term care for a future generation of people needing the care. And those on the wait list. This government has committed to long-term care, to advancing it, and will continue to do. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, the Ford government and this minister haven't just ignored frontline workers and families of loved ones in long-term care. They've been ignoring their own experts. The government's own panel on long-term care staffing called for urgent action, urgent action three months ago to put staff in place and to set standards of care in long-term care. And the Ford government responded by cancelling inspections and changing the law so that they couldn't be sued for failing to protect seniors in long-term care. The minister either failed to protect seniors or was prevented from doing so. So, either way, this minister should resign. And my question is, when will she? Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. When we, when we understand the, the needs of long-term care, and the complexities of not only the capacity that we've been working on uh, creating, the staffing that we've been working on creating, the emergency of COVID. We have been active ever since dealing with really what was absolute neglect from the previous government. And I, I do ask the member sitting opposite, where were you? Uh, in the previous years. years. For 15 years, you had the opportunity, you had opportunities to shore little. up long-term care, and you chose not to act. Our government has created a standalone ministry. We are working with other ministries, working across government, and, and so much work has been done. The funding has been there. The $540 million, almost three-quarters of a billion dollars, will continue to work on this. Our work isn't done. It has only just begun, and to repair, rebuild, Build and advance long-term care. And I well, remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Final supplementary. The leader of the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Well, earlier this morning, I was honoured to join uh, Kathy Parks and Ingram Innes, two of the thousands of Ontarians who experienced the horror of having their loved ones locked away in long-term care homes during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic's first wave. When Kathy and Innes and thousands like them cried out for help for their loved ones, the Ford government didn't just ignore them. They cancelled inspections, and they blocked a public inquiry, and now they're even taking away their right to a day in court. 
They protected themselves and the conservative insider lobbyists for private, for-profit, long-term care homes. So will the Ford government, at long last, do the right thing? Fire this minister, make the investments that are called for by their own experts months ago, Question. and stop blocking families who are seeking justice for the debacle that occurred in long-term care. Members will take their seats. The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'm pleased to, to stand and, and support my colleague and all the excellent work that she has been doing. We are the first government to come forward with, with a Minister of Long-Term Care, Mr. Speaker. It, we, were, we were doing this before the issues arose. We are aware of the 15 years of neglect by the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP all the way along, who are now shocked, shocked and appalled, that all of a sudden there are challenges in this sector. We are on this. It is a top priority for us. You've heard the Premier talk about it. We're doing everything we can to make sure that our loved ones are protected and we go through this difficult time. Mr. Speaker, I stand again with my colleague, who is doing an absolutely fantastic job. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, but I'd like to say I stand with the families of Ontario who went through hell through this year because their government didn't act to protect their loved ones. But look, the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic is hitting Ontario families now, and they're hitting, it's hitting us hard. And the experts have been rightly criticizing the Ford government for their lack of planning for the second wave, failure to invest, and confusing, sometimes incoherent messaging. Yesterday, we learned that the Premier's own MPPs are challenging the public health advice offered by the government. Then, amazingly, the Premier claimed that he asked his MPPs to challenge the government's advice. And then one of his own MPPs said that that was not the case. So, Speaker, can the Premier clarify what is happening for worried families out there? Can they clarify what the heck is going on over there? The government house leader. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is uh, investing uh, uh, billions of dollars in keeping this province going and keeping the people of the province of Ontario safe. The Minister of Health started off very early, ramping up testing from 40,000 all the way up to, uh, to 50,000, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've put uh, significant resources into our, uh, into our health care system. We started building long-term care facilities from day one. We started to move towards a blanket of care, Mr. Speaker, when the Minister of Health started after 15 years of ne neglect to bring Ontario health teams uh, into place, Mr. Speaker. This government has been moving mountains. We've been working with our uh, partners at the federal level. We've been working with our partners at the municipal level. And every step of the way, Mr. Speaker, this member here has been an armchair quarterback. I appreciated the assistance that they gave us in the early stages, Mr. Speaker. That assistance and that cooperation helped us bring down and make sure that, the, that uh, we flattened the curve. And I would suggest to the member opposite, join the rest of Canada, join the rest of us as we work towards one thing, keeping the people of the province of Ontario, keeping the people of Canada safe. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it's not surprising that the Ford government doesn't like to have to account for his actions. That's the way that um, uh, the Premier rolls. But families are really looking for leadership. They're looking for leadership in this pandemic, and they aren't impressed by the confusion that they're seeing from the government side. Prominent MPPs, like the pro uh, Parliamentary Assistant to Education, simply ignoring the rules. And the restaurant that he ate at literally having to apologize to patrons for his behaviour. The Premier said he bases his decision on the best expert medical advice, and then he also says, write to your MPPs and lobby them to get the medical advice that you want. Hmm. Who does the Premier think should be making decisions on public health? Medical experts or members of the Conservative backbench? Exactly who is making the decisions over there? The government house leader. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I guess that now, finally, after all of these years, it finally it's clear to me why it is that the people of the province of Ontario have only given the NDP one opportunity to serve in government. That question alone helps identify and clarify it all for me. What we've had is members of our caucus working hard on behalf of their constituents, working hard on behalf of the small, medium, and large job creators in their riding. What the member opposite, what the leader of the opposition is saying, and what she's saying to all of her colleagues, and, and thankfully, 
they don't listen. But what she's saying to all of them is ignore your ridings, ignore your, your, your constituents, ignore the people who help keep this economy going, ignore the people who've been working hard in long-term care homes, ignore the people who've been working on the front lines. Our caucus won't take that advice, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work for the people of the province of Ontario, and I suspect that the people of the province of Ontario, when they hear that question from that member, will it will be Response? solid in their mind why they will never return to government. Here, here. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you can't, on the one hand, say that you're following medical expert advice and then turn around and indicate by your actions that you're doing exactly the opposite. That you're working for lobbyists, that you're working, you know, for private interests in your riding. That's not how this should roll, and it's shameful that the government house leader refuses to acknowledge that what this government is doing is causing mass confusion and making us uh, have a much more dangerous situation in this province than we should. But here's where we're at: community restaurants are being forced to publicly apologize for the behavior of a Ford government MPP. Betty's Restaurant has more respect for public health than some of the members on the other side of the House. The government, uh, it, this is just a late, the latest reminder, in fact, of this government's lack of planning for the pandemic second wave. We don't know who's at the command table, what data they're looking at, and the government's own MPPs are criticizing the government's response. Others are ignoring public health guidelines and encouraging their friends and families to do the same. When is this government going to get its act together? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I would say that we have been very candid with the people of Ontario since the beginning of this pandemic. We have always relied on clinical evidence, the medical officer of health, and the many people who advise Dr. Williams. We have Dr. Williams as our chief medical officer of health, but we also have the public health measures command table, which is led by Dr. Williams, of course, by Helen Angus, the Deputy Minister of Health, and by Matt Anderson, the President and CEO of Ontario Health. The, uh, that's a command table. We also have the public health measures table that includes Dr. McEwen, Dr. Mowat, Dr. Feller, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Mackey, Dr. Romeliotis, and Dr. Spruitt. We've also had numerous uh, technical briefings and other briefings involving the uh, um, uh, mobile table, the command table, many other uh, technical Response. briefings on some of the issues that we are dealing with as a government that is important for all of the people of Ontario to know. The Premier has always said, what I know, you will know, and that is the way we have acted throughout advising the public. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, on Friday, CBC's Marketplace revealed that routine abuse and, violation and, and violence occur in most homes, and there are virtually no consequences for homes that break the law repeatedly. The report also highlights that for-profit home, like Craigley Nursing Home in my riding, and in fact, in the, in the two years that this minister has had this file, I have raised alarm bells about abuse like this, like in homes like Craigley Nursing Home. And it's, it's actually, frankly, insulting to hear ministers ask, where were we raising these concerns? Because it's insulting to the people of this province who have raised alarm bells about long-term care for many, many years. So in the past two years that I have been here, I have first raised issues about homes and, and the abuse. In this house, I asked the minister to extend the wet law for investigation and uh, accept the recommendations, the 91 recommendations from the report. Question. All she's done is cut inspections and pass legislations that actually pr protect homes instead of the residents. So I ask, Mr. Speaker, will this minister commit to taking immediate actions to address elder abuse in long-term care homes and ensure that long-term care operators are held accountable and re residents are kept safe? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I, I would like to clarify a few points in, in your question. And the first is inspections were never stopped. Inspections were continued. The inspections, we worked with the, the representative groups to make sure that our inspectors were safe, that there were lines of communication uh, with their inspectors into the homes. That was done with public health. That was done through the Ministry of Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Labour, uh, the Auditor General's report in 2015 that recommended homes uh, that were considered high risk to have high risk inspections. Um, and this was a, a measure taken by uh, the previous government uh, with a report based on the Auditor General 
General's recommendations. And our government has made sure that the inspections are ongoing. Our homes in outbreak are receiving regular inspections. As I said, multiple inspections, looking at uh, the, how we support our, our residents and staff in these homes. There is zero tolerance for abuse or neglect. Response. And there are channels to operate and stop that. We are taking every measure possible to make sure that our residents receive the highest quality they deserve and the respect. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, we know this government, the previous government has had failed, but right now the responsibility, the ball's on the court for this government. My office was contacted by Amanda, whose grandmother, Madeline, was a resident at Craig Lee until her death on September 20th. She recounts the horrific conditions that Madeline was found in and, dis, and describing, and I quote, the food left to rot in her room, the markings on her arms, her refusal to eat, her weight loss, her incoherence and delirium. She would decline the, the, and the home would tell us that she was improving, end quote. Following, following Madeline's death, the family went to her room to find evidence of rats and cockroaches in, in her belongings. Mr. Speaker, so I ask this minister again, because right now people are not safe in many homes. What will she do to make sure that residents are kept safe in their homes and we do not have elders being abused in long-term care homes? Because clearly they're not doing a good job. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, and, and thank you for the question. Thank you, Speaker. It is, it is devastating and heartbreaking to hear stories such as this, and my heart goes out to the families, to the residents, to the staff. And unfortunately, the system was broken, and it had been broken for many years. And that's why this government has made long-term care a priority. That's why these issues that were long-standing and were exposed by COVID-19 in a fulsome way for society to see, for society to see the neglect that had occurred in these homes for many, many years, and our government has created a standalone ministry to address this issue, not only the pre-existing problems, but the problems amplified by COVID-19. The inspectors, the public health, the integration, the public health Response. information. It is a cross-ministry effort, a cross-government, a cross-agency. We will put every measure, every tool into work, and we're doing just that. Very Thank right. you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Barrie Innisfil. Speaker, under the previous government, our manufacturing sector was battered by hydro, insurance, red tape, and taxes. Hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, in entire regions of our province were struggling. The latest challenge of our, manuf uh, our manufacturing sector has been COVID-19, which has put the health and security of our workers, supply chains, and jobs at risk. Speaker, will the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade update this House on our government support for a world-class manufacturing sector. Mr. of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, thank you to the member from Barrie Innisfil. With our support of the CME's Ontario Made program, businesses across Ontario continue to line up to showcase their products and their Ontario spirit on supportontariomade.ca. Through our Ontario Together Fund, we recently announced a $2.5 million investment as part of Greenfield Global's $75 million expansion to make medical-grade alcohol for hand sanitizer at their plant in Johnstown. An Ontario world-class workforce has the confidence of the pharma pharmaceutical giant Roche which announced a $500 million investment to create 500 highly skilled made in Ontario jobs in Mississauga and to build a global supply chain hub. Speaker, our government will continue to raise Response. awareness of made in Ontario goods, to invest in manufacturers and our supply chains, and to attract good quality jobs and investment at every opportunity. And the supplementary question. 
Thank you, Minister, for that answer and the positive news. We look forward to visiting supportontariomade.ca and for more Ontario Together funding announcements. I know in my riding, Jomi, Innovation Automation, CSB Drive, South Medic, Protomax, all manufacturers, they're stepping up to the plate. It's been six months since the full onset of COVID-19 in March, so I wanted to ask the Minister if he has other examples of manufacturers that stepped up to the plate and responded to the challenges of COVID-19. Of economic development. Speaker, the response from business owners and workers from across the province has been incredible. They have continued to demonstrate the best of Ontario's spirit. Recently, StatsCan showed that Ontario gained 168,000 jobs in September alone, of which almost 52,000 were in the manufacturing sector. With that milestone, Employment in manufacturing in Ontario is now 17,000 jobs higher than pre-COVID levels. Speaker, this is a significant bit of news, but we know there's much more to do. Unlike the previous government, which lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs, we work to reduce business costs for manufacturers by over $5 billion a year through lower costs, lower taxes, and less red tape. Bonds. Speaker, those fundamentals are still in place which is why manufacturers continue to make Ontario their new home. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, the Premier slipped arts and science degree granting by Charles McVitty into legislation that's supposed to be about helping small businesses recover from the pandemic. Now, the only reason anyone can come up with is because it's a payback, payback to a longtime friend of a Premier's. Even when that friend has made a career out of bigotry, homophobia, transphobia, and Islamophobia. I have to interrupt the member. You can't impute motive. All right. But place your question. Oh, okay. The government's only justification for doing this now is that an independent assessment board will ultimately decide if McVitie's college has what it takes to grant these degrees. But that application has now mysteriously disappeared from the review website. And before it did, it stated that legislation was imminent. Is the government ready to drop the charade and just admit this is a favour to a long-time friend? A response to parliamentary assistant, member for thank Thornhill. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, I understand that there's a process, there's an independent review. I think everybody in the legislature, people at home who are watching, who work at, for a company, they understand that there are review processes. It's an independent process. We cannot interfere in an independent process. In terms of the website, PCAP has said that there was an issue with the web compliance of the application, and they are working to have it posted publicly again very soon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And a supplementary question. Until now, Charles McVitie's college has only issued degrees in religious programs like theology, but their plan is to get into arts and science degrees. Yesterday, the Faculty Association at the University of Waterloo wrote to the minister and to the premier, and they wrote, I quote, I was shocked to learn that your government intends to allow the Canada Christian College to award university degrees in arts and in sciences. The publicly funded university model that we have in Ontario requires further investment, not dilution, by enabling privately funded institutions to offer poor programs on an apparently equal footing. So my question, why is the Premier rushing degree-granting status through this omnibus bill for his buddy Charles McVitie when real universities need further investment, and especially during this pandemic? In the parliamentary system. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think everybody here is aware that Ontario has a long, proud history of um, supporting all religions and religious institutions. We have a long, proud history of supporting our independent colleges and universities Order. and enabling legislation for private faith-based degree-granting institution has happened under governments of all stripes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Ottawa Venue. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Recently, we learned of a memo that was sent to long-term care homes in September that told them they were on their own when it came to ensuring that they had enough staff to manage a second wave of COVID-19. 
No later than yesterday, a resident of Ottawa Vanier, whose mother is in a residence with confirmed cases, told me that testing was taking too long with delays for testing and delays to get results. The early recommendations of the Long-Term Care Commission are addressing these exact issues. The Commission said the province should implement its own existing staffing plan and ensure residents have better access to testing and faster results. Will the Minister listen to the Commission and put in place the staffing plan and improve testing and other recommendations without further delay and ensure that necessary funds are committed in the upcoming budget? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, the staffing is a, a multi-ministry effort. Uh, the lead on staffing and the human resources is through the Ministry of Health. Our Ministry of Long-Term Care had the expert panel uh, report, which we have taken uh, to heart and have been acting on, having input into the overall human resources strategy. Uh, we put dollars behind that. Uh, we certainly appreciate the uh, commissioner's uh, interim report, uh, an early report for guidance. Uh, it is very much appreciated and very much aligned, largely aligned, with what we are doing. And so very much uh, appreciate uh, the importance on staffing, which we've said since day one. And $540 million announced just a couple few weeks ago, $405 million going to that to help with staffing supports uh, and IPAC Response. measures to give staff confidence in the long-term care homes that they work in. So this work has been ongoing, and we'll continue to do that work, and we thank the commissioners. And the supplementary question. Thank you, my, Mr. Speaker. My question again for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The number of long-term care and retirement homes battling outbreaks in Ottawa right now is higher than it was back in April. I know the Minister is fully aware of this, but it is difficult to understand that we have not done what was necessary to avoid the devastating effects of the second wave. Having a standalone Minister of Long-Term Care, one would expect that proper attention and sufficient resources are devoted to provide effective care and protect the health of her family members in these homes. The minister admitted yesterday that she knew since taking office at the head of the ministry that staffing was an issue. So what exactly has the minister done since then and between the first wave and the second wave to address the obvious challenges of shortage of staff to protect our long-term care residents and their families? Thank you. Again, the Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you for the question. Uh, as I've said before here in the chamber, we're addressing the long-standing neglect of staffing over many, many years by the preceding government, as well as dealing with the emergency situation that COVID-19 has caused in our homes. And I can tell you that the vast majority of the 17 homes in Ottawa have no resident cases whatsoever, and our homes are doing very well. They are stabilized. We have the integrated response through the hospitals. We are shoring up staffing. Uh, we are using the Red Cross assistance, and I thank them for their assistance as well. We are using a multi-pronged approach to get rapid deployment teams, whether it's community paramedics, Red Cross, hospital, and actively working with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Labour and others to shore up the staffing overall. So this is a two-pronged approach, one dealing with the emergency situation, one long-standing, and we will continue to do that. Our homes are, are getting the support they need, and uh, an outbreak uh, situation is, is a somewhat misleading because the vast majority of those homes have no resident cases. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that now more than ever, Ontario's programs and frontline services need to be more convenient, reliable, and accessible for the people and businesses of Carleton and Ontario. One way that our governments are successfully adapting to our new normal is by providing more digital services and embracing modern technologies. And I'm proud to say that this government is ending 15 years of inaction on the part of the NDP-supported Liberals. In fact, Mr. Speaker, just last week, the President of the Treasury Board launched Ontario Onwards, COVID-19 Action Plan for a People-Focused Government which will allow healthcare professionals to rapidly and securely access patients' health records, improve access to broadband and cellular services, reduce red tape for local businesses, among other things. Mr. Speaker, would the President of the Treasury Board tell the House more about how we are planning to move Ontario onwards? I'm going to ask the uh, independent members to quieten down over there. 
Parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'd like to start by thanking the hardworking member for Carleton for that excellent question, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, the world has changed, and government must change with it. That's why we're expanding the range of pro programs and services available online, simplifying the government's role in people's lives and businesses. Ontario Onward COVID-19 Action Plan for a people-focused government includes more than 30 projects that will change the way people and business interact with government. A parent, Mr. Speaker, for example, could easily access their children's immunization record. A senior could securely share health information with caregivers. Mr. Speaker, it's just the beginning. We're undertaking an across-the-board modernization of the entire government, and we are moving Ontario onwards, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the parliamentary assistant to the uh, president of the Treasury Board for his response, and also. Uh, just mention that I know that the people of Aurora, Oak Ridges and Richmond Hill are well served by their hardworking MPP. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's great to hear that unlike the previous government, this government is working for the people. And we know that by improving access to programs and support for frontline government services, including health care and Service Ontario, we are helping businesses and individuals make it through the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the projects identified in the action plan focuses on a digital wallet, which Ontarians could set up for themselves or their business. I have heard that the digital identity wallet would allow me to share personal information while avoiding the need to scan and send in identification insecurely through email. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the President of the Treasury Board Should. tell the House more about the digital identity wallet? The parliamentary system. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member again for the question. Speaker, we're thrilled to announce the development of the digital identity wallet to the people of Ontario. A digital identity wallet stores identity credentials on smartphone or other devices, helping people and businesses verify their identity anytime, anywhere. A small business owner could cut through red tape, for example, by registering for licenses and permits online. A farmer could register a farm vehicle online without needing to spend a day in the car, Speaker. Ontario Onwards is about making government services more convenient, reliable and accessible for the people and businesses of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Digital identity is just one of the many projects announced as part of Ontario Onwards, Ontario's COVID-19 action plan for a people-focused government a plan that will make government more effectively for Ontario's people and businesses. Speaker, it's an online Spons. world. We can't have an offline government. Oh, yeah. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, residents from Sudbury and Coppercliff are frustrated they cannot get their flu vaccine in my riding. Jacqueline Trainer, a senior from Sudbury, she said that she can't find anywhere to get an enhanced flu shot. Another constituent who is a retired physician in my community said he tried finding a vaccine for him and his wife. They tried three pharmacies and one walk-in clinic. All four locations told them they had their orders on backlog. They couldn't even book an appointment until they had a better idea when the vaccine would be coming. This government's lack of planning keeps failing, Senior Speaker. They failed them in Sudbury, they failed them in Coppercliff, and they failed them across Ontario. How could the Premier completely underestimate the demand for this year's vaccine and let down so many seniors? Mr. Long Term Care. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Health, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, in fact, we did plan for this pandemic. We ordered 700,000 more shots this year than we did last year. The orders are coming in. They were, orders were set virtually a year ago because we have to order them far in advance. We uh, planned that they would first be delivered when they first came in at the end of September to long-term care homes, to hospitals, to retirement homes that were participating, and other places of congregate care. Excuse me, congregate care, so that we could protect those vulnerable residents. But we're also shipping to primary care facilities, to, to doctors' offices, to nurse practitioners, and to pharmacies. We have already received over 4 million of the virtual 5.5 million doses that we've ordered. They have been shipped out. They are being received on schedule. I'm very happy that people are going out to get the flu vaccine, Response. many people this year that have never had it before. But that is uh, why some are having temporary shortages, and I'd like to speak to the fact that there are no shortages in my response to the supplemental. Supplementary question. Member for Lancaster Dundas. Uh, 
I, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that I find it insulting to hear this minister brushing off the real concerns of the people of across Ontario. Frontline health care workers like our family doctors in Hamilton play an important role in keeping us safe. That's why it's so distressing to hear from constituents and physicians alike who are unable, unable to obtain flu vaccines. A constituent recently received this message from their doctor. We are terribly sorry to inform you that we will no longer be able to run our previous planned flu vaccine clinic. Please note that the flu vaccine shortages throughout public health is a systemic issue and applies to all family physicians in the surrounding area. Our constituency offices are flooded with calls and emails from, from people that cannot get the flu vaccine, and I can only imagine it's the same for the PCMPPs as well. So, Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier or this minister, what do they have to say to doctors Question. and their patients across Ontario who are trying to keep safe and healthy but are not able to get a flu vaccine because of this disastrous shortage? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you. There is no shortage. There may be a temporary shortage in some of the pharmacies, and we take the concerns Order. of nurses, doctors, and patients across Ontario very seriously because we know every year thousands of people are put into hospital because of flu, and some unfortunately die. So we are very uh, pleased that so many people are taking this seriously. But we have ordered, we ordered over. 700,000 more flu vaccines this year from last year, and through Health Canada, we've also been able to order an additional 350,000 doses. So we have over 5.5 million doses that are coming to Ontario. So any shortage that's happening in either a doctor's office or in a pharmacy right now is a temporary order. shortage. We have no indication that there are any shortages worldwide. We are receiving Response. shipments uh, from global manufacturers on a regular basis. There are no backlogs. There are no delays. We are receiving the shipments, and people will get the flu shot. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, last week, I asked about Schedule 2 and Bill 213 that would allow Canada Christian College, run by Charles McVitie, to become a university and to issue degrees in arts and science. And I want to acknowledge the member for Kitchener Centre, who raised this issue first in this House, Mr. Speaker. As so many have now pointed out, McVitie is a man who has repeatedly made vile comments about the LGBT community, about Islam, and has propagated hatred. The fact that he is being rewarded either for that behaviour or or for supporting the Ford campaign in the last election, or both, should be a cause for great concern for anyone who values democracy in our diverse society. But, Mr. Speaker, the message that this action sends goes far beyond this specific case. In fact, it encourages institutions to rely on the protection of this government, even if they insist on harboring bigotry. And case in point, for some months, the Toronto Catholic District School Board has refused to sanction at least one of its trustees for behaviour that appeared to be a breach of its own code of conduct. Question. The, the board commissioned a report in 2019 concerning the trustees' conduct, and um, it, the allegation was that trustee Michael Delgrand violated the trustee code of conduct by using similarly vile language to Charles McVitie. The Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The question has been placed, and I'm going to recognize the Minister of Education to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What I said at the time is that the trustees' comments were unacceptable and deeply disturbing. We live in a province where we accept all people from all walks of life, of all heritage, faith, orientation, gender, place of birth. This is the strength of our country. And I feel very strongly about this. That's why in the health and physical education curriculum, the first curriculum I unveiled, we took significant action to counter homophobia. In fact, in the context of teaching young people, about homophobia. We introduced in grade two a section specifically dedicated to seeing the visible and invisible differences to counter this form of bullying that exists within our schools. We know there's more to do, but I have spoken out unequivocally and strongly against that trustee, the Toronto Catholic, saying that it was unacceptable and urging the board to commission an investigation. And we look forward to accountability for those students who've been offended Response. by the comments made by that trustee. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, then I would ask the minister to ask that board to release the report so that the community can understand how and why Trustee Del Grand was exonerated. This is a government that ran on 
objection to the very sex ed curriculum, the health and physical education curriculum that you're talking about, and so there is a very little faith that this government actually supports those ideas. Mr. Speaker, we have made great progress in our province and in our country on the recognition of rights of all people to be their authentic selves, but that progress has been hard won, and it's fragile. When people like Charles McVitie and Michael Del Grande, who are privileged men in positions of authority, are still able to espouse hateful ideas with impunity, we all lose. It should not matter that Charles McVitie supported Doug Ford in his leadership bid and in the 2018 election. It should not matter that Michael Del Grand was budget chief to, Robert May to Mayor Rob Ford. These men should be held Question. to the same high standard that we demand of every child in our publicly funded schools. They should be expected to be compassionate, decent role models for all who hold them in high esteem. I ask, Mr. Speaker, again, will the government refuse to expand the power of Charles McVitie, and will it release the report that went to the TCDSB so that we can all understand Thank you. why Thank you. <laughs> Parliamentary Assistant for the uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and we've uh, had this question already today. Uh, basically, there's a process in place, there's an independent review, uh, we're all awaiting the outcome of that independent review, and then we will be able Order. to comment. On this side of the House, I'm sure people will agree Order. that um, we have a long history of supporting all religious institutions. In fact, all three parties, Mr. Speaker, have a history in Ontario of supporting uh, all religions, all religious, all religious communities, and all religious institutions. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, uh, COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on how much we rely on online services. More than ever, Ontarians across the province are using digital platforms to take care of personal and professional businesses online. I understand Ontario onwards, Ontario's COVID-19 action plan for a people-focused government will make this easier than ever. My constituents and all Ontarians want to know that when they use our online services or share data with the broader public service, their personal information is being protected. This being Cyber Security Awareness Month, would the minister please explain what this government is doing to ensure that my constituents' data is protected? Thank you. The parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you to the member from Perry Sound. Muskoka for that important question. Mr. Speaker, as the threat of cyber uh, crime grows and changes, so too must our defences and preparedness. That is why our government continues to leverage the cutting edge of Ontario's cybersecurity expertise to protect our digital service platforms and the information shared with us by business and the public. Earlier this month, in collaboration with Ryerson University, we held our first ever virtual cybersecurity conference for the broader public sector designed to support public sector organizations to keep pace in an environment of rapidly evolving threats and an increasing demand of digital public services. This conference explored the current and future cyber risks and focused on how to implement best practices and protect vital information and systems. Our ongoing partnership with Ryerson will support government staff Response. to operate safely online. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Parliamentary Assistant Bailey, for that response. The uptake of digital services is not something new, and we saw a significant uptake well before COVID-19. In fact, many Ontarians already provide their personal information to the government and government agencies. As with private businesses, Ontarians rely on the government to keep their data protected when it is submitted and digitally stored. Ontarians need to know that the government is keeping this information safe. Can the parliamentary assistant please tell this House and the people of Ontario actions this government has taken to ensure this data is being managed safely? Thank you. Parliamentary assistant reply. Thank you again uh, to the member for raising this very important issue. It's important that Ontarians know that our government understands these concerns and is proactively working to address any threats to their personal information. The initiatives I, I mentioned earlier build on the expansion of the province's Cyber Security Centre of Excellence, established last summer as a key part of Ontario's cyber security strategy. COVID-19 has meant that more Ontarians than ever are relying on digital platforms to carry out their day-to-day -day tasks. With the increased reliance on these platforms, there is a strong need 
to protect the integrity of our data and digital economy. That is why our government recently launched consultations with key stakeholders to improve the province's privacy protection laws, improve accountability, and safeguard that information. Our government is committed to protecting Ontario and their data privacy. Thank you. The next question, member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. Bonjour, merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Prime Premier. Whereas uh, the Minister of Long-Term Care said that, that she did everything that she could to limit uh, the spread of COVID-19, people in the north are still waiting for help from the province. The Pionier Long-Term Care Centre has only five nurses and five PSWs that are doing everything that they can to provide adequate care. There are 63 seniors that are waiting are on a wait list, and the wait list on average is four years to have access to this care. Premier, do you think that people in the North deserve to wait four years to have access to care that they need? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the concerns across Ontario. That's why our government is, has been continuously working to address the capacity issues, the staffing issues in long-term care that were still badly neglected for so many years under the previous government. Uh, we are working across ministries with the Ministry of Health, working uh, with the reports that have come to us, uh, taking active measures, putting funding towards the staffing, whether it's for personal support workers or for RNs, for the rapid uh, 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 tracking for the, the nurses and the PSWs, the return of service, uh, $26 million to help uh, retain and recruit uh, for for our PSWs, $52 million just announced in, in September, $405 million uh, just a few weeks ago to address the operational aspects and the staffing supports that are needed. Uh, this is multi-ministry, uh, as I said before, and we will continue to work to address the concerns all across Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier has uh, spoken at length without offering any concrete measures. In the Pioneer Long-Term Care Centre, they're struggling to meet the needs of the population. In Hearst, there's no transitional beds and at-home care are sparse services. The Long-Term Care Centre is asking for 12 supplemental beds. They've had discussions with the former Liberal government, and they've made several requests to this Conservative government. The region needs more beds in order to meet Francophone seniors' needs. Will the Premier recognize the need of Francophone seniors, and will he meet the needs, the cultural needs and the Francophone needs in the region of Hearst? Thank you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government values the cultural differences uh, across Ontario, and we recognize the importance of long-term care homes to be able to provide uh, for services in the language uh, of their of the residents, uh, and that is why we have many homes that are, are staffed and supported in those measures. We continue to create uh, tools and uh, efforts and put funding behind it to provide uh, the retention and the, the pipeline of, of, uh, of service providers, whether it's nurses or whether it's PSWs or whether there is other support staff. Uh, I, I value our personal support workers, our staff in long-term care homes, as does our government, and we are taking every measure possible to make sure that our homes have the support that they need and their cultural differences are respected and valued. We will continue to put respect Response. and dignity for our residents at the forefront of our decision-making. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Premier. During this period, it is important that the government avoid providing inconsistent or false information. As mentioned on Sunday, the Toronto Sun reported that the Premier had no idea two of his MPPs. The uh, member to withdraw. The Toronto Sun reported that the Premier had no idea two of his MPPs signed a letter to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. On Monday, the Premier said he knew the letter was coming and even urged it. 
Later, CTV reported a third version of the story. I was hoping the Premier could tell us which version of the story is correct. Did he know and urge his MPPs to lobby the Chief Medical Officer of Health, or did he not know? And why are sources in the government providing different versions of the same story to the media and the public? Doesn't the Premier believe that inconsistent information to the media during a pandemic only works to erode public trust? The government house leader to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Reply. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think I answered this yesterday in the House. Uh, uh, the uh, member for uh, uh, Burlington and the member for Milton uh, were responding to uh, what was a difference of opinion between the mayors and the chief medical officer of health of Halton uh, uh, with respect to uh, stage two. Uh, the, the members, the two members, uh, 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 wrote to Dr. Williams in an attempt to help uh, offset or break that logjam, Mr. Speaker, so that they could provide additional data. I think it's something that we would, uh, hopefully all members would uh, would act in, in very much the same way. The member is quite correct uh, in, uh, in, in suggesting that the Premier had already spoken to the Mayor of, of Oakville and was aware of the issue, and of course the member for Burlington uh, uh, spoke with the Premier and let the Premier know that, uh, that a clarifying letter uh, to help break this logjam in Halton was coming forward. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, another inconsistency in the information provided yesterday. The Premier said he told local politicians in Halton to push back against the Chief Medical Officer of Health if they weren't ready for another lockdown, suggesting that it was the Chief Medical Officer telling the Premier to consider this move. But the Chief Medical Officer of Health told CTV News he made no recommendations and neither did any local Halton Medical Officers of Health. Which version of the story is correct? why the inconsistency in information provided to the public. Is the government okay with confusing the public or not? Or is this the government's way of passing the buck? Government House Leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, it, it, I think it's, it's actually fairly obvious that uh, there is a, a growing disagreement uh, between uh, especially the mayors of, of Halton and their Chief Medical Officer of Health. I, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Speaker, the Chief Medical Officer of, uh, of Halton uh, added extra measures beyond some of the measures that we had introduced uh, uh, in the region that uh, the mayors were not supportive of. So there is a disagreement uh, between uh, elected officials in Halton and their chief medical officer of health. We, of course, uh, encourage uh, them to, uh, to, uh, to work together. I applaud both the member for Milton and the member for Burlington uh, for uh, uh, trying to do their best to break the log jam between uh, the two. It is, the, the member is quite correct. Uh, when there is an inconsistency between elected, fish, elected officials and the uh, medical officers of health, it does raise problems, and it is our job to make sure that, uh, uh, that we close that gap, Mr. Speaker. That's what we have been doing. Uh, right from the beginning of this pandemic, uh, response the, uh, um, the, the advice from our our, uh, our medical officers, and uh, and again, I applaud both members for doing uh, uh, what we would expect all members in this place would do uh, when it comes to disagreements between their medical officers of health. And Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long Term Care. Last week, I asked the Minister of Long Term Care for action to contain the outbreak at Lakeside Long Term Care. There are now three deaths, 26 resident cases, one hospitalization, 10 staff and two essential caregiver cases. There are still delays in getting test results. Results of tests done three weeks ago were either not received at all or were received much too late to do any good. Why is the government allowing the outbreak to rage on? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you for the question. We are making sure that our homes have the support that they need. All 626 homes are partnered with a local hospital to support them, making sure that the infection prevention and control uh, expertise is available to our homes, taking every measure possible. The testing, the surveillance testing is being done on a rotating base of every 14 days and in sometimes more frequently than that. Uh, that the backlog has been cleared from the testing, and that is the Ministry of Health managing the testing, but I'm happy to speak to the aspects surrounding the testing and long-term care. Uh, the backlog is an essential piece to understand. Now that that is cleared, uh, the testing in our homes uh, will, will improve to make sure that we have the rapid testing, to have all the tools that we need to really prevent COVID from getting in in the first place. It is an invisible Response. intruder. And that is something that long-term care homes across the world have been grappling with. But we will continue with the testing that is uh, ramping up and is up to 50,000 uh, tests possible per day. So this is something that... Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Back to the minister. 
Lakeside Long-Term Care has UHN as a partner already, and yet the outbreak continues. The government's own Long-Term Care Commission findings highlighted that homes across the province are dangerously understaffed, and so is Lakeside. The Commission has urged the Minister to implement staffing study that has been sitting on her desk since July. Will the Minister commit to the staff, residents and families at Lakeside that she will implement the Long-Term Care Commission's interim recommendations immediately? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. However, I am going to push back on this continued narrative that is absolutely misleading, that something has been sitting on my desk. It has not. Mr. to withdraw. I will withdraw, but I want to clarify this. We have been active on this ever since we had the report. Work has been ongoing. This is a narrative that continues to, to pop up, and I want to express my sincere uh, regret that this narrative continues despite the clarifications that I've given over and over again. The work is continuing, always was, and will continue. We will advance long-term care. We will we'll repair it from decades of neglect, and we will rebuild long-term care. That means staffing and capacity and innovative programs and determination, much better than the previous government ever bothered to. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. At the beginning of the pandemic, the Premier said that an iron ring would be built around uh, long-term care homes. And despite, uh, despite his statements, unfortunately, thousands have become sick and, and died over the course of the pandemic. After months and months of dithering, the government finally announced that they would have a long-term care uh, commission because the Premier wanted to take urgent action. Last week, the Commission highlighted the urgency of the situation in long-term care, Mr. Speaker, and asked the government, advised the government to fix the chronic understaffing in the long-term care homes. Moreover, the Commission reminded the government that they know exactly how to do this already, that they've had a report since July telling them how to uh, move forward with staffing in, in the sector. The government now has two reports telling them exactly what to do to fix the staffing crisis in long-term care. When is the government going to take action? Again, the Minister of Long-Term Care. I will repeat, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I will repeat what I have said numerous times before, is we have taken swift action all along, across ministries, across uh, uh, levels of government, working with the federal government to understand uh, streams that we can um, work with them on providing the, the necessary training uh, and, and retention for PSWs and support workers in our long-term care homes, and across the health care sector, for that matter. This work has been ongoing, and we've been putting dollars behind it, improving the, the, the wages for our personal support workers, an increase of $3 per hour, a $461 million commitment, a $540 million put out just a few weeks ago uh, to support uh, the operations and, uh, in our long-term care homes, $61.4 million to make sure that our, our homes have the necessary uh, supports for infection prevention and control to encourage Response. stabilization of our homes. We continue to put out dollars behind the actions that we're taking to support our homes. We'll continue to do the work, uh, the work that was never done under the previous government. And the supplementary question. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementals for the minister. Well, clearly, the government's own commission doesn't think that's good enough because they've asked for timely action on their advice to be taken, uh, Mr. Speaker. This is their report, uh, not my words. But let's also look at what's in their report. Uh, they've included sentiments uh, from people they've heard from as part of their review so far, Mr. Speaker. Sentiments like that it's devastating and emotional, that people are lonely and depressed, that people feel muzzled and trapped that they're broken-spirited, that the situation in long-term care was Order. terror awakened. Terror awakened, Mr. Speaker. The government has asked experts for advice. Experts have given the government advice. When are they going to take it? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, 
for the question. We have been taking the advice of experts all along, whether it's our chief medical officer of health, uh, experts uh, surrounding uh, virology or infection prevention and control. This has been ongoing, and we make sure that our homes have the support that they need. This is a challenging, unprecedented situation affecting long-term care homes across the world. Our most vulnerable people are in long-term care. And I want to express my, my deep condolences to everyone who has been impacted by this. All of us have in some way. All of us have been touched by this. And we have to continue to do the work that is absolutely necessary to shore up staffing. And I appreciate the work of the commissioners to provide this, this guidance. This is something that we have been working on ever since we started as Response. a new ministry with a sense of urgency. And I appreciate the, the input and guidance from the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, the member for London West. Of health. Speaker George White is living with ALS and relies on home care for bathing, toileting, feeding, and transferring from his wheelchair to his bed. But the chronic shortage of PSWs at Paramed has meant that George is regularly forced to sleep in his wheelchair because there was no evening PSW. Last week, he sent me this email. Quote, Paramed has reached a new record for service providers. Four out of the last six nights, they did not send a PSW to put me to bed. That means I've been in soiled diapers for at least 14 hours for those days, from 2 p.m. until 6 a.m. That is inhumane. Speaker, I agree. Clearly, privatized home care is failing people like George White. Will this government agree to end the unreliable, understaffed, and unaccountable for-profit home care system and make home care public. Mr. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. While I appreciate that George's situation is unacceptable, um, I don't agree with, uh, with the solution that's been proposed by the member. What we are doing, however, I can advise that we are putting $457 million to increase home and community care capacity as part of our COVID preparedness plan for the fall because we recognize that there may be some people who can be cared for at home, which is where they want to be instead of in hospital. But we know that we need to put more resources into that, and that's why we've put that $457 million into it, which will greatly increase the number of visits that will be available to people and the number of hours that they will be available. By the same token, we also recognize that there has been um, a, a shortage of personal support workers, that while we're graduating thousands of them, there are also thousands of them that don't stay in, in long-term care or it, as personal support workers, either in long-term care or in home care. That's why we are increasing their hourly rates to, uh, and to encourage more people to stay in, in the uh, as personal support workers, but we recognize there are other issues that um, affect their uh, working conditions, why they may not want to stay in it. We're still undertaking our discussions with the Personal Support Workers Association and with other stakeholders to encourage more people to come in to work both in long-term care as well as in home care. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.